I'm going to present a uh, bit of my recent work on what I would, would like to call Greek, bio, uh, Greek body politics, uh, which is sort of uh, introduction of the concept of uh, um, uh, biopolitics to the reception of classical archaeologists. <clears throat> uh, in his novel titled The Archaeologist, originally published in 1903, Greek novelist Andreas Karkavitsas presents Greece as a fledgling nation state in the lethal entanglement of its own once glorious past. In the story, uh, for those of you who don't know the novel, two brothers are trying to protect the land they have inherited from their famed ancestors. One is clever and pragmatic, whereas the other, the archaeologist of the title, is devoted to the study of the past and its tangible remains. Whereas the latter believes that only the promotion of their common heritage will help them survive in a hostile world, the former urges his brother to live in the present, as it were, and stop dreaming of bygone days of glory. The archaeologist's foreign friends, on the other hand, are only interested in the antiquities hiding in his land and encourage him to devote himself exclusively to the study of the past and the promotion of his land's archaeological wealth. In the end of the novel, the archaeologist is killed when a marble statue he has excavated collapses and crushes him <laughs> during the wedding of his younger brother, who then lives happily ever after with his peasant <laughs> wife. Actually, this is the, the, the last line of the, of the novel, um, and they all lived uh, happily ever after. <clears throat> the novel's protagonist, an archaeologist by conviction and not by trade, is described as the victim of his own archaeology, as well as the disingenuous Grecophilia of his foreign friends, styling themselves with ancient Greek names, reading old books, and robbing archaeological sites in an attempt to construct a cultural genealogy for themselves. While the westernized archaeologist seeks his own identity, as well as that of his nation, in the foreign books he reads, the illiterate peasant girl Elpida, Hope, uh, who, according to the text, could not possibly survive under the eyeglasses of the knowledgeable foreign men, knows the truth of her origins as it has been transmitted to her from generation to generation. By the time Karkavitsas was writing his novel, all major Athenian museums and many regional ones had, of course, already been up and running. The National Archaeological Museum, the old Acropolis Museum up on the hill, the Numismatics Museum and the Epigraphic Museum in Athens, as well as the museums at Olympia, Sparta, Epidoros, and so on. This is the old museum at Olympia. Four museums were founded in the year 1900 alone, Corinth, Thera, Halkis, and Mykonos, while from um, 1903 to 1906, nine more were going to be added, three every year, including the museums at Delphi, Nafplion, Delos, Heraklion, and Volos. These did um, what museums are expected to do across the globe. They collected, conserved, preserved, displayed and explained archaeological artifacts as tangible evidence substantiating the nation's long, linear, uninterrupted, and exceptional history over the millennia. Their tactics, as well as their rhetoric, reflects Western expectations of the Greeks as curators of their past, as well as the Greeks' own pride for securing the job. The fashion through which modern Greek, uh, Greece chose and still chooses to display its classical heritage illustrates the persistent ambivalence in the way the country faces the world to the present day, as well as the strategies deployed by contemporary Greeks in order to claim classical tradition as their national property. As Stathis Gurguris has observed, contemporary Greek culture becomes characteristically insular, experiencing itself as both superior and inferior to Western culture, being both xenophobic and xenomanic, believing itself to be the most privileged and the most oppressed. Reiterating modern Greece's connection to its classical past, stereotypically advertised as Europe's own genealogy, creates, I would like to argue this evening, a pattern of repetitive reenactment, what Sigmund Freud described as an as an inexplicably persistent history of suffering and what he clinically termed as trauma. In a seminal study of historical trauma as both experience and reference, Kathy Carruth theorizes the notion of trauma 
as unclaimed experience, as history no one talks about, in order to suggest that visiting and revisiting the site of trauma, the place where it all happened, as it were, creates new modes of seeing and of listening. Before describing what, in my view, constitutes Greece's modern sites of trauma, I would like to return to an example I often use when I talk about the way modern Greece displays the material remains of its classical past, Alain René's 1959 film Hiroshima Mon Amour. The film has been found to open up the question of history as an exploration of the relation between history and the body. The question of history in the film transcends the concerns of what we see and what we perceive, what can be summarized as the body uh, in the line quoted above, but also the ethics of choosing what to tell, remember, and what not to tell, forget. My interest in the film is due to a long sequence in its beginning, referring to the museum in Hiroshima, a sort of museum of national trauma, which has not been extensively discussed by previous scholarship, but would be very interesting for us to revisit here. In Hiroshima Mon Amour, scripted by Marguerite Duras, the viewer witnesses a long, frustrated dialogue between a French actress and a Japanese architect, re respectively identified only as she and he. She finds herself in Hiroshima for a short 36-hour period in order to participate in an anti-war film project. The two strangers have a brief affair, and the movie follows them through their separation. Besides being a contemplation on the Hiroshima atomic bombing of 1945, the film dwells on the tension between memory and oblivion, identity and anonymity, presence and absence, all staged in a bleak landscape of abandonment, defeat, and loss. Despite the film's title, Hiroshima is not really loved by anyone. As a cultural landscape, it has been rendered into a site of conflict, claimed by two opposing sides, one accusing the other of neglect and forgetfulness. He says in the beginning of the film, you saw nothing in Hiroshima, nothing. And she replies, I saw everything, everything. Thus runs the film's opening dialogue of recriminations between the two former lovers until the Japanese man accuses the French woman of not being endowed with memory. According to Marguerite Duras, herself born in what at the time was French in the China, now Vietnam, Memory is the privilege of the colonized, while oblivion is the, time, the crime of the colonizers. Being seen is being remembered, accepted, and recognized, and topographical landmarks help a country to be seen. The film's opening sequence lists among the venues where the town's memory is kept alive, the hospital where the bomb's victims are treated, and the museum where the bombing itself is documented. The woman remembers. Four times at the museum, four times at the museum in Hiroshima, I saw the people walking around, the people walking around, lost in thought among the photographs, the constructions, for lack of anything else. The photographs, the photographs, the constructions, for lack of anything else. The explanations, for lack of anything else. Four times at the museum in Hiroshima, I watched the people I myself, lost in thought, looked at the scorched metal, the twisted metal, metal as vulnerable as flesh, human flesh suspended as if still alive, its agony still fresh, stones, charred stones, shattered stones. Cultural trauma is an experience consisting of an incident of severe physical and mental injury, followed by a belated series of symptoms bearing no causal relationship to the original injury. I find this notion both relevant and compelling. I would like, therefore, to suggest that Greek archaeological spaces, both museums and sites, operate as sites of trauma, as the playscapes where the unlived experiences of an imagined past become revived. Behind their neoclassical facades, Greek museums built in the years after the liberation and until as late as the 1950s strive to treat the material remains of the classical past in the ways devised by Western archaeology. Meticulous taxonomies, arcane terminologies, essentialist readings, linear narratives. As has often been stated, 
The European Museum has been deployed within Western societies both as a disciplinary tool and an apparatus for control and surveillance. Exported beyond the West, the museum functioned as vehicle for hierarchies and genealogies produced in the West. In the words of Eliot Kola, uh, artifact is both a useful label for classifying proper objects of study and a powerful concept that helps to move the horizon of interpretation beyond that of the immediate present. Taking material remains of an earlier culture found on Greek soil and turning them into classifiable, collectible, and readable artifacts satisfied the sensibilities of a European elite constructing its own identity on these very artifacts. At the same time, this process, defined as artifaction, enabled the repossession of the past, which also meant repossessing the present. Finally, it also proved that the Greeks same as the Egyptians, the Indians, or the Siamese at about the same time, were as modern, metropolitan-like, and Western as anybody. Museums and sites in contemporary Greece work hard to attract the gaze of the tourist and gain the visitor's appreciation. Objects, duly cleaned, restored, and cased according to the appropriate artifaction techniques, signs and reconstructions, for lack of anything else, repeat stories of mourning and loss, relate the trauma of temporality as a belated experience, as an experience forever unclaimed. However, this very effort to repackage the past as spectacle, in the sense first exploited by Heidegger, in order to suggest Greece's genealogies as well as the world's debt to Greece, inaugurates the forgetting of Greece's singularity by forgetting its referential specificity. It has already become classical, global, atemporal. Think of Hiroshima Mon Amour once again. The lines of the man in the beginning of the film are the complaints of every Greek, Egyptian, Indian, or Japanese, every local who feels that his culture is not really appreciated. While the visitors protest that they have seen it all, or he knows they have seen nothing. The performance of one's cultural authenticity remains unnoticed. In many instances, Cultural patrimony is used by countries in the periphery of the West, such as Greece, eternally struggling under the shadow of the West in order to compensate for national shortcomings, real or imaginary. Greek demands for the Elgin marbles are a case in point. Abducted from Athens by members of the Western elites infused with the neoclassical spirit of dilettantism, the marbles are now housed in London in the Metropolitan Museum par excellence, where they are displayed alongside archaeological remains from the entire world, as objects of world culture, as well as documents of Britain's imperial force, now heavily subdued. The Greek campaign for the return of the Parthenon slash Elgin marbles has often become a quasi post-colonial battle, as Greece seems desperate to affirm its cultural supremacy against its allies, constantly questioning Greece's efficiency as a modern state. For a culture to achieve its decolonization, it needs to attract the colonizer's gaze in the first place. Such conflicts over who is controlling cultural visibility are waged every time a peripheral culture feels attacked by the appropriation strategies deployed by the metropolis. Intensive restoration of sites and monuments, such as in Olympia, Epidaurus, and of course the Acropolis itself, create simulacra of ruins, antique rather than ancient, for the gratification of the tourists' need to commemorate their actual presence on the site through the taking of pictures or videos, as well as the Greeks' need to appear worthy of modernity as well as of their antiquity. Through such performances of modern ethos, Greek archaeological sites and museums utilize strategies, technologies, and narratives taken from the colonial archive in order to reaffirm their allegiance to Western modernity. For when neoclassicism seemed to be losing its erstwhile attraction, archaeology in Greece underwent an intensive modernization procedure, from the looks of its museums to the bravado of its technological advancements in excavation, conservation, reconstruction, and monument enhancement. In that respect, no Greek museum is more national than, than the new Acropolis Museum. As I have already argued elsewhere, this museum employs an aggressive as well as improvised 
technology of enchantment by directly referring to the salvationist and conservationist tactics of the world's massive metropolitan institutions, such as the British Museum, the Acropolis Museum has been conceived as a weapon in Greece's effort to claim new ways of centrality in the world cultural system. Its exhibits are aesthetically modernized, treated as ends in themselves, as well as excerpts of a wider narrative that appears at once nationalist, exceptionalist, anti-colonial. The exhibition of the Parthenon marbles in the Acropolis Museum's top floor ga gallery reads like an exploration of national trauma. The remaining pieces are shown next to the copies of their missing brothers and sisters, human flesh suspended as if still alive, its agony still fresh. Shattered marble exhibited next to plaster replicas for lack of anything else. The reconstructions, the French woman is heard saying in Hiroshima Mon Amour, have been made as authentically as possible. The illusion, it's quite simple, the illusion is so perfect that the tourists cry. The Parthenon marbles are then offered to our gaze, displayed as the relics of a by now sanctified Hellas, as the holy stigmata of national exception. For the Acropolis Museum and its rhetoric, the gaps in its display function as a repetitive reenactment of a traumatic event, the unexpected and overwhelming violent interruption of the nation's historical continuum, while at the same time pinpoint with merciless precision the essence of their traumatic absence. What for the West is arguably the beginning of its reconnection with classical genealogy, for the Greeks is the beginning of a separation from theirs, like the Hiroshima bombing for the Europeans signifies the end of the war rather than the beginning of Japanese suffering. Heritage is then deployed as a weapon, not against colonialism or globalization, but against a metropolis which appears to be monopolizing modernity. Greek museums westernize their exhibits in order to attract the gaze of the West, or in the case of the Acropolis Museum, re-elginize the Parthenon marbles in order to tell the world that Greeks can be better on modernity as well as in antiquity. Classical Hellas is thus represented as a site of conflict and as Greece's national treasure as well as its passport to modernity. Greece's archaeology of national trauma is nowhere more evident than in the heart of its uh, largest cities, in those hubs of metropolitan modernity where urban life is abruptly and in a somewhat brutal way interrupted in order to allow glimpses of the distant past to seep through. Whereas museums and organized archaeological sites are well-defined areas where the informed and most likely uh, paying public is allowed to interact with carefully laid out and expertly um, interpret interpreted material remains of a past that is deemed important in the present, the scraps of ancient ruins preserved in the corners of our streets or squares constitute a different sort of sensory reminder of the nation's antiquity, as well as of its primeval ties to its land. Archaeological preservation is, of course, part of a modern state's duties in the interests of humanity, and there are well-defined sets or often strict, most likely international rules, specifying what needs to be kept, where, and how. Inevitable as it may be, the modern habit of preserving bits of antiquity within the urban grid allows Greece to exercise this particular sort of archaeology with a vengeance. Be they well-groomed and tidy, or simply allowed to fall anonymously into disrepair and eventual ruins, ruin, sometimes successfully incorporated into modern buildings, um, purposefully designed in order to accommodate the leftovers of the predecessors, or more often awkwardly placed under massive new constructions that seem to ignore them, Greece's in incidental antiquities serve a strategic purpose. For the unsuspecting foreigner, on the one hand, they act as an eloquent reminder of the land's antiquity, and hopefully of its commitment to a modernity that has recognized the pursuit of history and its material traces as one of its fundamental values. Next next to the country's expertly as well as heavily reconstructed archaeological sites 
its own urban streets themselves act as its modern signature, combining the rights to a spectacular classical heritage with the will and the ability to manage it successfully. On the other hand, the ruins preserved within Greece's modern uh, urban centers are there to interact with the country's own citizens. They are there to remind them of antiquity's metaphysical grip and indeed recreate antiquity as an ever-present ontology. Rescue archaeology is across the globe all the more often asked to reconcile the need for urban expansion with the interest of archaeological research and the conservation of material heritage. In Greece, these parallel narratives inevitably came in conflict with one another as massive modernizing projects such as the building of a subway train system in Athens in the 1990s and currently in Thessaloniki, or the massive venues erected mostly in Athens for the 2004 Olympic Games seemed to demand from the country to choose between a glorious past and a highly promising future. In all these instances, the demands of the, of the present are juxtaposed with the allure of a past which becomes needier by the second. Behind this conflict has the frustration over who is to control the narratives through which one may define the past and control the present. This is hardly original, of course, and far from being a Greek privilege. What, however, constitutes a, a certain Greek singularity, so to speak, is the very way in which the past, through its archaeological manifestations, becomes available in the present, the roles of it, it is allowed to perform within and in regard with it. The display of antiquities is a central feature of most Athenian metro stations. This is my station, Daphne. I saw this on my way here this evening. A central feature of most Athenian metro stations, so much so as to make one wonder whether this sacralization of urban space was not in fact the reason behind the Metropolitan Railway's construction in the first place. In a city where uh, metro stations look like museums, and museums often copy the practical aspects of a metro station, think of the escalators of the Acropolis Museum, <coughs> space becomes a commodity of particular significance a place where the past is revived in order to be inscribed onto the daily routines of the Athenians, as well as impress the tourists, themselves usually construct constructed as ever hungry for visualized history. Metro stations in Athens seem to be doing what its museums perhaps fail to do. A casual trip reveals the people walking around, lost in thought, and of course the objects themselves, vases and sculptures, shattered stones, bits of buildings, tools, jewelry, and weapons, the twisted metal, sometimes in the original, but more often in reproduction, lest they be pinched or vandalized, charts and graphs, the photographs, the photographs, the constructions, all in specially designed museum-like cases and panels with voltex and itineraries designed by the State Archaeological Service in order uh, on the one hand, to promote the material remains of Greece's classical past, and on the other, to imply the modern state's ability to, in turning them into world-renowned star exhibits. The need to appear as Hellenic as Western imagination ever wanted Greece to become, and at the same time, as modern as no one ever thought Greece could become, thus turns urban spaces into monuments in and of themselves as if the country's hundreds of museums were not enough to monumentalize its fabulous temporalities, it seems there is an urgent need to turn its capital's pharaonic metro stations into museums in themselves, often designed by the same museographers and always employing the same artifaction techniques uh, in order to inscribe national time onto national space. The outcome of this artifaction project, as a result, the artifact itself, is this new performative way of looking at Greek archaeology and becoming part of it. The classical past is therefore revived in the present both as a paradigm as well as a promise. Greece's constituent archaeology informs and controls the quotidian mov movement of its citizens in intervention disguised into the prospect of a spectacular future. Greeks find themselves organized in this way as archaeophiliac bodies in their metropolitan everyday comings and goings, 
as faithful carriers of a splendid, albeit imported, tradition, as well as the worthy recipients of a much coveted inheritance. At the same time, this pride in one's past is expressed in the form of silent anguish against the trauma of, what sa of that same past neglect by the nation's friends and foes alike. It seems that although the nation's archaeologist, or indeed the nation itself as its own archaeologist, strive for the nation's um, archaeological visibility, they also realize that public displays of archaeology tend to work as disciplinary tools at home rather than with an international audience, which is invariably accused of having seen nothing, nothing. As Caruth observed, it's precisely through that sort of seeing from the side of trauma that a, spectacular may, a, a, a spectator may indeed become a witness. But what lies there to be witnessed at? Among the Athenian metro displays, pride of place must be accorded to the archaeological stratigraphy sections constructed in some of the stations, chiefly Syndagma, Acropolis, which is this one, Monastiraki, and Daphne, the one we started with. This is Syndagma. Appearing as an imaginative cross between tedious scientism and abstract interior design, those brightly colored, sculpture-like tableau invite the gaze of the traveler, or indeed the visitor, to the station in order to turn her or him into a witness of Greek history turned into spectacle. Though presumably accurate scientifically, these sections are obviously man-made, representing what was discovered, including remains of buildings, pits, tombs, and pottery shirts stuck in their archaeological context. As the successive times of each locality are exhibited piling up one on top of the other, they are meant to serve as a poignant reminder of what Greece had to lose in order to embrace modernity, however good uh, the Greeks may have proved to be in the job, while at the same time visiting the site of trauma where this transition became more demanding. The temporalities of the Greek nation, already mythical or in the process of becoming mythologized, are in this way collapsed into a voracious present, even when they appear as no more than dusty displays cramped in the corner of a metropolitan station meant to serve hundreds of thousands of commuters on a daily basis. Similarly, those rescued scraps of antiquities preserved in situ in the margins of the modern city grid in this peculiar no man's land between public and private space often occupying the edges of our squares or the basements of our buildings claim the gaze of the passerby wishing to chart contemporary Greece as an ancient nation or rather a historical site where classical materialities are still in force even when viewed from a distance. Even when rotting in the side of our streets covered in white foliage and completely illegible under long faded signs meant to provide them with the appropriate if often incomprehensible scholarly documentation those necessary places of archaeological contemplation with the wire fences and forbidding locks remind us of the past's very antiquity through the monumentalization of the present, a game with time, in effect, striving to cover the painful distance between reality and its representation. The Athenian metro is where this forceful representation of Greek modernity is constructed in a heavily aestheticized fashion. The underground's technical achievement, one for which the Greeks felt co collectively proud when the service first opened to the public, is emphatically mirrored by its luxurious construction. Massive spaces, shiny marble surfaces, daring pyramid-shaped glass skylights, and so on. And its strict policies against buskers, or even eating and drinking on the premises for fear of soiling. Um, of course, the relentless a recession since um, 2009 and the reduction of their own staff owing to the drastic budget cut, cuts has forced the metro authorities to become somewhat less vigilant against beggars who often now patrol um, the trains while in motion but remain unseen in the stations themselves. Stations, therefore, remain museum-like, both in their effort to offer a sterilized environment to their day-to-day -day users as well as in their art displays. A number of contemporary 
Greek artists, ma many from the Greek di diaspora, like Takis, Chrysa, and Stephen Andronakos, whose work we're looking at here, are featured in stations often associated with their activities. For example, Alekos Fasianos was asked to decorate the station at Metaxurigio because that was near his uh, birthplace. Whereas most of these wish to represent modern Greece as a truly Western society in line with uh, artistic and cultural developments elsewhere, classical tradition often creeps in to remind us of its stronghold over collective Greek sensibilities. Dimitris Mitaras's Dexilius uh, from the year 2000 is the best example of this. Displayed over the main wall of the ticket concourse of the Daphne station, again, my station, I saw it on my way here, with smaller additions elsewhere in its premises, the work is a large tableau in relief, deconstructing the well-known image from a fourth century BC grave stele erected in the Keramicus for a young Athenian cavalryman who fell in battle. The modern work plays with the forceful poise of the youth on his horse, sp spearing his enemy in the moments of triumph uh, just before his own death, as well as uh, with the lettering of the accompanying inscription. As a public display of the way modern Greeks attempt their own national archaeology, as emotive attachment to the material remains of an ancient past they persistently perceive as theirs, Mitaras's de Xilios confirms the nation's infatuation with the graceful motifs of classical sculpture as a way of reinforcing the day-to-day -day commuter's commitment to the country's past. In order to Hellenize modern Greek space, therefore, this display and others like it simultaneously produce a territorialized version of classical antiquity specific to Greece and its inhabitants. The artifact produced here, then, is personal time itself and its everyday applications. My time, your time. Commuters are inscribed with a fragmented image of their fallen ancestor as repetitive reenactment of their nation's traumatic history, as well as a visual reminder that the repossession of the past through its own materiality is necessary in order to repossess the present. The examples discussed so far suggest that in contemporary Greece, the relation to the past is perceived as a traumatic revisiting precisely because of the precariousness of this relation in the first place. The disdain expressed in the archaeologists on the threshold of the Greek 20th century reveals its author's frustration against his, his compatriot's persistent mimicking of Western-born archaeology and fetishist archaeology. In the traumatic decades that followed, Greeks felt the need to reaffirm their cultural identity in the face of political and financial adversity, and classical antiquity was enlisted as their most far-reaching weapon. In this process, the relation to the country's past acquired in Greece a strikingly materialist quality. As the fledgling nation adopted its, its patron's archaeological zeal in order to impress them with its newly imported scientific skills. Greece's representation of itself remains largely archaeological as a result of a crypto colonial effort to mimic attitudes and traits seen abroad, admired, and loathed at the same time. As a result, the classical past acquires a forbidding territoriality, excluding all non Greeks alienating even those living in the country itself. For although these claims are meant to rescue classical antiquity and its material remains from the Western-born hijackers and their museums, they end up creating an exclusionary realm, archaeolatric and archaeopathic at the same time, wherein only Greek-borns are expected to feel at ease with this kind of crassly constructed and heavily materialized Hellenic distinctiveness. The examples I discussed this evening, I would argue, um, illustrate this production of national subjectivities to which quotidian life in Greece seems to be utterly devoted. Classical antiquity, or rather its ghostly apparition, imagined, celebrated, and recycled abro abroad as well as at home, is always here, though its overbearing presence is by and large experienced as a traumatic absence. The contrived 
archaeologists of Greekness discussed here are meant to enable contemporary Greeks relate the trauma of temporality as a belated, though forever unclaimed experience, as a performance of mourning for a present that is past no more. Thank you. <laughs>